Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of our Trade Centric University Masterclass Series, Separating from the Pack, B2B Trends that Drive Success via Connective Commerce. Today, our hosts are Kevin Kazemeyer, Vice President of Channel Development at Trade Centric, and Paul DeForno, Managing Director, Commerce Practice at Deloitte Digital. In this session, you will discover cutting edge research from Deloitte Digital. Gain insights from real life examples illustrating the impact and potential of B2B connective commerce. Explore best practices for implementation to ensure the successful adoption of this approach. And ask our experts any questions you may have. As a reminder, you will be on mute for the duration of this masterclass webinar. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A function and we'll address them at the end. And now I'll turn it over to our host, Kevin. Hey, thank you, Melissa. Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm excited once again to be hosting another edition of our masterclass series and to also have Paul DeForno joining me once again. So welcome, Paul. Thanks, excited to be here. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this session today. And for those of you who don't know me, I spent a large portion of my career in the distribution space, both in office products, MRO, and building supplies, really enabling customers to connect our e-commerce platforms directly or through integrated solutions. So I'm excited to hear the research and insights that Paul will be sharing today surrounding B2B e-commerce. And so without further ado, Paul, I'm going to hand it over to you so you can tell us a little bit about yourself and then, you know, let's let's get into the research. Sure sounds good. And so my background, I've been doing commerce for uh, 20 plus years, started off in B2C, some very large transformations, some of the biggest in the world with like companies like Target, Victoria's Secret, Foot Locker. The last five years, I lead up our B2B commerce practice at Deloitte Digital. Deloitte Digital is the largest commerce agency in the world, and we work across everything from strategy, implementation, and, and build. And one of the things that we also try and do and invest in is like also do primary research to really understand what is the things that are changing in the marketplace in B2B. And so this is what we're going to be sharing about some of the findings that we had that we, we did jointly. So uh, the one place I'd like to start with is, first of all, wh what is B2B commerce? And, and really, if you look to the right on this uh, slide, if you just go back to the basics of selling, B2B sales is really at the simplest way, it's a business seller selling to business customers, right? So if we step back and like, that's traditionally what been B2B sales. And so what we like to think about what B2B commerce is, everything digitized buying and selling that enables B2B sales is what B2B commerce is. It's, it's a holistic. And I like to use this graphic that we have here as just a, 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 an example set of personas, right? If you look at selling to B2B isn't just like B2C at, for businesses because it's way more complex. There's many different personas and it's different by different companies, how many different sales managers, procurement, people in the, in the uh, field. All of these are different types of sales and ways that you need to connect to actually get the sale. So Paul, I got a question there, right? So this, I think this visual underscores like all the personas that are typically involved in, in a buying org in a B2B purchase. How much are supplier or seller organizations aware of all these types of personas? Is this just something that's really coming to the forefront now and that and generating that awareness? They are aware that they need to, that all of these people are part of the process. The disconnect is they may, may not be all connected or digitally connected, right? And, and that's really part of what this whole B2B commerce is trying to help solve. And, and that's part of the research that we looked at is what, what are the pain points? How are these companies reacting? And, and what, what have we seen in the marketplace? And it's really about how do you make it easier, like, you know, from the salesperson to make it not only easy for them, but like 
if I'm in the field and I need a replacement product, how do I make it easy for them to make that order and sell and get that shipped as, as soon as possible or out there? So how do you think about all of these different personas? And that's really what the disconnect is, is how do you make it easy for all of your people um, as far as suppliers in, in your marketplace? Got it. So it's not as much as about you know, the old school way of, well, I'm going to go visit them and I'm going to take that order on paper and hand it over to someone. These personas, they're not, they're not looking for that type of interaction anymore. They want it easy and simple to get on with their job, right? Exactly. Right. All right. So if we jump into um, the research that, that I talked about. So we worked with uh, research uh, partners to look at and, and reach out to 600 companies from uh, half a billion to multiple billions of dollars and, and got lots of great feedback. And what we did was summarize, you know, four key trends that I'm going to walk through one by one. And, and I'll just highlight, you know, you know, the first one, moving at the pace of customer expectations. And this is something that, um, the what we found is there's a large gap for certain uh uh digitally native uh people out there and they've they've found like if you've seen now millennials make up the largest portion of the workers out in the marketplace and in fact gen z is approaching how many workers are are equivalent to uh you know uh, some of the older workforce. And so what we're finding is the lack of these tools are people are going, well, I'm going to go where it's easy to order, right? If I have a, if, if I have to call somebody or still, there's still manufacturing companies sending uh, facts out there, like they're going to go where it makes it easy. And we found that 13% of total B2B sales are lost because of these lack of digital experiences with the sales process it, which is which is just massive it's it's kind of insane i to think that you would be willing to risk 13% of your sales cuz you you know the lack of focus um what do you what do you think plays into that why are why are the like i would be shining a spotlight on this number and saying you need you need to really meet your buyers, where they want to transact and how they want to transact. So did you find anything in your research that's kind of causing this, this type of friction? Is it just like a certain segment? Is it a certain uh, like product type industry or is it just across the board? I, I think you'll see different numbers across the board, but I, I think the some of the older line manufacturing, industrial, chemical types of companies um, more so on that side, because, you know, traditionally, a lot of those sales have been in industries that they didn't think that could become as digitized. And so you still have a lot of the management that grew up in a certain way and look to that, whereas more high tech um, and, and other industries have actually been ahead of the game. And so there's it's a little distribution, so much more on on man, manufacturing and chemicals and less so on some of the high tech and uh, it, it, you know more other branded ones. Okay, makes sense. All right, so moving forward, the next trend that we saw. Um, so one of the things that we we saw in some of the research is that like what people reacted to it and actually hurt. Um, some of the challenges in getting a sale is friction points. And these friction points, in another way of saying this, and we've done voice of the customer research where we've seen that it's not just about the buy button or buying, but all throughout, how is it easy? Is it easy to go research products and see specifications and see what products can work with other products and, um, being able to see the status of my order. So all of these are friction points in the buying process. And so B2B commerce is all about not just the buy part, but how can you make it 
as easy to do business with all the way through. And so what we saw in the stat here, 45% of the B2B companies say the purchase process is still extremely or very manual, which means you know maybe they got a website up, but then you can't order. Maybe they can order some small set of products or, hey, they can't configure products. So you get all of these friction areas that, again, what you find and what we've seen in some of the research as well is if you see those friction points, you may just move on to the next supplier. And, and so in the it, big insight on this trend and the takeaway is you're not just trying to make it the buy uh, button and, and solve for that. It's the whole, all of the interactions that you work through. Try to reduce all the friction points as part of the, the selling and buying experience. It, it, it's a great point, actually, because I just was at a, at a conference a couple of weeks ago with a lot of distributors, all shapes and sizes. And my first question to them, every time we would sit down and talk, I would ask them, tell me what your commerce site is like. And it's interesting to hear what some think a commerce experience is. And when you, when you bake it down, it's actually, they believe their commerce experience is a marketing site. You know, I have some products. I tell a little bit about my, my, my products, but when it comes to actually buying it, it made that buying process so complex or you must submit a quote or you must email somebody or you must call somebody. And it seems like what you're calling out here is that if we're not looking at that entire process and making that entire process seamless, they're willing to take that business and go find someone else. Absolutely. So, and, and this is something that we work with a lot of our clients is, and this, there may be different friction points for different segments or different business units. And, and so, you know, a lot of this isn't like, you do it all once and you're done. It's it's an ever changing, you keep refining and looking at friction points and making it easier continually as you continue to be, you know, you want to be ahead of your competition and make sure you're the easiest to do business with. Yep. It's the, uh, they, they say it's an evolution, not a revolution, right? Exactly. Yep. All right. Let's, let's go on to the next so one of the things that we're seeing, uh, and, and I'm sure many people on on the webinar today, there's a massive upgrade happening for a number of different platforms. Um, you know, be it SAP, Oracle, many others. There's large transformations that are happening. In fact, almost half of the companies are in the midst of either upgrading or planning to upgrade within the year, and and so. Based on this, that's that's massive. So if you think about it, for many of these, especially manufacturing companies, it's a significant amount of their tech stack and their interact and the things that support them to do business. And so the one thing that we've seen on the next slide is what we found is at this point, think of it like this way. Many companies are doing this massive back office upgrade. Well, and those back office that you know functions might be upgrading fulfillment, supply chain, parts of their financial accounting, demand planning. Well, you have to do that. Like, you know, no, you know, nothing against that, right? But in, in many ways, what many of the companies are coming to the um the understanding is they have to also think about how they their front office or how do they connect to sell and b2b commerce is really in the middle of that it's kind of at the middle in combination with marketing sales service and, and so what we're seeing is a lot of customers like well if i'm gonna now it's kind of like thinking of it this way if i'm gonna remodel half of my house well i should probably think about remodeling the, the the whole house. And in fact, we've seen a couple case studies and the example on, uh, on the slide, we recently uh, were working with a, a large client that they were about to do a, an upgrade and they realized they didn't have a good business case to help drive it, but they knew they had to do it. And so 
what they started to expand their thinking was, well, what if we also thought about adding e-commerce capabilities and, and some of the related commerce capabilities? Would that help our business case? And in fact, what we found was even though that front office investment was only 24% of the investment, it actually produced 57% of the business case. So what that means, in other words, is the front office helped to pay for the back office. And it could happen at the same time. So it's a win-win. And so this is a pretty big insight that we've started to see over the past year and a half that, you know, for the, for the people listening, like if, if you hear, hey, we're just doing, we just have to do this upgrade, come back later for the front office. Well, actually, if you, you know, invest, and many times it's much smaller than what it is for the back office, you'll actually get net new revenue or additional benefits that were not considered or part of, because it's almost like the, some of these upgrades are more of like, you know, you have to keep the lights on, you have to do those. Yeah, I mean, it makes complete sense because if you think about it, you know, there's so many more buyers are demanding access to at their fingertips, right? Into the supply chain. I need to see everything. I need to know if you're going to have that product for me, where it is, when I'm going to get it. And I want to know my price. And so by, by looking at whatever you're doing in the back office and finding out how to even feed that to the front office as you're doing those enhancements, it's just making that 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 buying experience that much better for the buyer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and also an important thing here that as far as this front office is, it, it also has to be deeply connected to the back office. You want to make it, again, you don't want the friction points. You want the visibility to be in through and you want to make it easier to do business with. So these are all part of the capabilities that that are important, uh, you know, and what companies are are looking for. All right, for our last uh, major trend that came out, th this is something that um, I, I think that we've we've started talking about B two B commerce as omni channel, and this is something that you know 15 years ago that we went through with B two C commerce, but it's important because, and I'm not saying that omni channel just as kind of a buzzword, but it's important. If you say that, it forces people to think omni-channel. Well, how can it be omni-channel in B2B? Well, actually, there's a lot of different ways that you can do B2B commerce, right? And I think for the most part, people think of um, B2B commerce as kind of the direct website. And, and in many times, especially in B2B companies, they might think, oh, that's that channel over to the side. And it may not be integrated. And so, you know, we've talked already about like really all this B2B commerce is the digital part of B2B sales. So it's all to facilitate that. Well, what's clear and what's happening is that there's all these other channels that you connect up. It's not just your direct website. There may be marketplaces out there. You know, I, I'm sure you've seen and been on Amazon. There's a business related a marketplace out there that sell between businesses and there's a lot of vertical marketplaces that are popping up and, and and vertical marketplaces that you would have not even imagined like 10 years ago like chemical uh marketplaces and also there's a lot of enterprise tools where you can create your own marketplace that you're selling complementary products that you're continuing to sell and so connecting that as well um, you know, a big area that I, I know, Kevin, is the passion of you guys that around procurement commerce and and that might be kind of integrating back to procurement systems like Ariba, Coupa and all the, those sorts and, and a, around that too, punch out. And this is actually what we've seen over the past couple of years is like that might be the least known of these channels in, in a lot of B2B companies, but it may be the fastest growing. And what we've seen for those, like that might be an interesting segment where some of the old school companies have like for 40 years, maybe used EDI. And then there's another segment that have now standardized and started to use some of this procurement. 
And really that procurement commerce is really that connection from um, these uh, procurement systems into your commerce directly. And, and I, know, I know, Kevin, you're going to talk a little bit more about that, so I, I won't go any more. But then again, there's other channels like, you know, white labeling dealer portal. So you might be selling a product in a manufacturer and you have dealers out there and you facilitate a white label dealer portal that shows how to sell those, right? To CPQ and revenue management, quote to cash and connecting those and, and to sales assisted order on behind order on behalf and online chat. And I, and I think you're going to continue to see more channels pop up on here. And this is probably, again, one of these key things, if you think about after this uh, presentation is, you know, you want it easy to do business with and B2B commerce is omni-channel and there's so many opportunities here. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of opportunities, right? And you got to think about where is the best opportunity for your business to really grow, right? And I think you called out a lot of good, good areas, right? You think about marketplaces and marketplaces are exploding just as much as procurement com commerce is exploding. So um, it's really, I think it's, it's looking at what's the best fit for your business. But, you know, at this point, I think we're, we're going to take that double click and we're going to go into the, the procurement conference, uh, commerce part of it. But we're going to start off by a quick poll and just asking our audience, do you actually know what procurement commerce is? The yeses are leading the way here. It's still rolling in. Looks like, Paul, we have about two thirds that are saying they know what procurement commerce is. Um, one third is either they don't or unsure. That's probably a little skewed bit. A little skewed to you know people who already know about trade trade centric and and your capabilities, <laughs> but I think in in general, uh, it, it's 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 a lot lower in the general populace. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody for for participating in the poll. We're gonna we're gonna close the poll down for right now, and we'll go ahead and let's just for those of you that are unsure or or don't know. We're going to talk a little bit about what is what is e-procurement first, right? And I think um, that's really where you have to start. So before we get into talking about procurement commerce, let's talk about the pieces that make it possible. And, and that's really e-procurement. It starts off with an e-procurement system. And, and why do buying organizations use it? Well, you know, e-procurement platforms, they've existed for like, you know, for well over 25 years. Um, I can tell you because I've kind of been working in them for that long. Um, it, but these software platforms, they allow for, for buying organizations to streamline the entire procure to pay process. So from, from rec, requisition to check is the common term. So basically by extending the research, order, approval, every type of capabilities that you would want uh, from a buyer to everyone in the organization. And when it's deployed properly, uh, with all your relevant suppliers included, um, these platforms, they can provide large amounts of data and insights into purchasing patterns, trends, uh, budget allocations, uh, all while staying compliant with uh, procurement and corporate policies and procedures. So that's kind of what e-procurement is. In e-procurement, a common thing that has been attached to e-procurement over the years is punch out. So, you know, a little bit about what is punch out. Well, your customer now has an e-procurement system. You would most likely want to, or you would get asked to provide a punch out site for them. And wait, basically what punch out is, it connects the buyer's e-procurement system to the supplier's e-commerce platform. So essentially bypassing the traditional login process and allowing users direct access to a supplier storefront where they can search, access all their preferred products, their pricing, see inventory, availability, and, and basically instead of checking out like they would traditionally do on a commerce platform, a card is returned back to their procurement platform to go through budgeting allocations and approval routing, 
and then get a purchase order signed when they finally send it to you to, to fulfill the products. So that's kind of punch out and, and e procurement. And, and so I would now, just add there, just to go back for a second on yep. punch out, I, I almost see that as the best of both worlds, right? Because you're in the, you have the procurement controls and you don't leave and, and those that stay in place, but then you have the great user experience of the, uh, the seller's commerce experience. So you kind of connect the both worlds and well, that, that's what we're seeing the largest growth in. Yeah. So to that point, Paul, you, you talked about building the features and constantly evolving. You're able to then take advantage of those features that you built in your commerce platform and continue to extend them to an audience that may not have been able to access them before. Yep. Okay. So, so now let's tie it all together, right? And let's talk to procurement commerce, uh, or as we like to call it in trade-centric, B2B connected commerce. And we call it that because it connects the suppliers, e-commerce and order management and financial systems with buyers, e-procurement and ERP systems through not only punch out, but also throughout the entire order to pay process, which includes automating purchase orders as well as invoices, right? So. That way we look at it, procurement commerce, connected commerce, kind of sets the tone for kind of where we're 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 focusing on today. So so Paul, kind of you talk about procurement commerce channel and that and that it's kind of it's growing, right? And I I have a slide that I want to share here that kind of shows where it is going. And and these are 2022 numbers because we haven't seen the 2023 full numbers yet, but you know, this space has right now, well over a trillion in, in revenue generating through it, right? So I think the last numbers I saw was 1.2 trillion, probably going to be higher at 2023. And the growth over the last three years has gone from, you know, 12 to 15 to 18%. So more and more buyers are utilizing these types of platforms to transact with their suppliers. So what's your thoughts on, on this growth? Yeah, I think this is a natural right? There's all of these things are this growth to be much more digital. You know, if you look at the macro, if you step back and look at all the B2B uh, sales and, uh, you know, Digital Commerce 360 really covers this. There's there's around 17 trillion of B2B sales in the U.S. And right now, just around for rough numbers, around 50% of that is still done in a quote unquote manual way, meaning, you know, Checks are sent, electronic wires that have to be then posted, et cetera, in lots of different manual ways. And so it's just the cost savings of going digital, it, it just has to happen that we're seeing a large of these companies. And so if you look at specifically for procurement, you're also seeing the growth of, you know, these Ariba Coupa systems that are controlling buying patterns and, and trying to keep to large companies, um, you know, maintaining their policies and buying areas. And so those are growing quite a bit. And so connecting these two things, it's just natural that you're going to see this growth continue to happen. Okay. So let me take that one level further than with you. You said about 50% is still not automated. And there are some naysayers out there that'll say, well, my business is immune to that. We're always going to be manual. Do you think there, that 50% is going to get less and less and is going to get down to a single digit number? Or do you still think that there's going to be some kind of even keel here? Yeah, I, I think it's appropriate. If anybody's seen the, the headlines today, Macy's is closing a third of their stores, department stores, right? Like, they were slow to, to pick up digital and you see where they are now. Any company who is not embracing digital, it will meet the same challenges, right? There'll be competitors that make it easier to do business with because, you know, going back to our trends, the, the, the people are demanding it. The buyers are demanding it, right? It just makes it easier and the cost support is, is less. And so this is, it will happen. The question is how and when. Yep. So it sounds like the moral of the story is don't become a, a Macy's or maybe even a Kodak, right? Everybody knows yeah. the whole Kodak story and 
and they all were were ready for it, but then didn't make that decision, right? So I think these numbers are kind of saying you probably need to take a deeper dive into this to make sure that you are not immune to your current processes and, and there are ways to drive this going forward. Well, I actually want to share something as well. So we did a um a recent report as well, right? So we did a study and in our study, we kind of saw the same thing, right? And we saw that six in 10 companies are reporting that around 20 to 25% of their customers are actively asking for some sort of e-procurement system integration, but less than 35% are doing something about it. So it, there, there's some definite opportunity here, but it feels like, um, there's a lot of underinvestment and buyers are clamoring for integration. And it feels like only those who, who are offering will come out on top. So, you know, our data, Paul, kind of, our data and research is really telling a similar story to what you were just presenting in, 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 in your four um, topics there. But with the demand growing, doesn't this shine even a bigger spotlight on the need to focus on this channel? Yeah, if if I was, a, I'm sure, and and I'm sure these are challenges that all B two B companies are thinking about, and right, and they're not thinking about it like from a necessarily a technology basis or from uh, uh, on specifically B two B commerce and that. Really, what's happening to them is, uh, oh my God, I need to drive growth. Why is it not happening, right? And so, hey, I'm my competitors are growing so much faster. What's going on? It's really the wake up call for the ones that haven't looked at it is your businesses are inherently people are running circles around you. And that's what I would be scared of if, if I wasn't having these conversations. Not that the technology necessarily is is cool onto itself, which me being a geek in this, I, I think it is. But from a business perspective, these are real outcomes that make a difference and, and that are really driving this. Yeah, well, I geek out on this stuff too. And it's a reason why I've been doing it for so long, but I know that there is opportunity and I've seen it happen at previous companies that I've been at. Um, so I guess I, I want to transition real quick into a, another poll to see, especially since we had a lot of people talk that they, they know e-procurement is, you know, have your customers um, or have you gotten requests from your customers for e-procurement integrations? And again, love to hear what some of those thoughts are because um, I'd also love to see some additional questions or some comment comments afterwards of, you know, why you do or don't or why you haven't uh, or have not chosen to go down this path. So. We have the poll up. There we go. I'm not seeing any nose uh, yet. <laughs> I probably should have uh, put a couple of questions as follow-up polls to say, if yes, are you doing anything about it? Um, it looks like we have a large portion of our audience here, Paul, saying that they've they've gotten a lot or they've gotten a few requests from their customers to to do um, connected commerce and connect into their their procurement commerce. So, um, you know, I think some see this as white noise sometimes and 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 don't always look to find solutions to it. Um, but you know. I guess I would say some of our most successful customers are telling us that the connected commerce is actually driving success for them. And, and we can go ahead and close this poll. And I want to share a couple of uh, interesting, you know, metrics that we, we track and get your thoughts on this poll as well. And, you know, when you think about connected commerce and, and what we hear is that not only are, are our customers seeing growth in overall revenue, but also in the back office, right? They're seeing 
improvements in the order to cash process, right? They're getting paid faster. They're having, you know, smaller uh, customers, amounts of customers going on credit hold because they're providing them the convenience and ease of, of, of an invoice and getting paid on time. And they're also limiting the amount of, of manual touches placed on every order and invoice. So in that case, they're, they're again, limiting the number of errors, um, failures, they're limiting amounts of, of actual people having to rekey data into a system. So, you know, thinking about these metrics as a whole, you know, how, how would, would you compare this, uh, Paul, to like what you see? Is this, is this kind of like valid metrics in when you're building out a, pl a success plan for the organizations that you're working with? Or what other metrics would you kind of look at as well? Yeah, uh, for sure. These are the one. These are the most important, right? And you know, depending on uh, depending on the company, um, between you know, most are around new revenue streams. That's really been the big driver of you know how do we you know continue to grow, right? That's been number you know number one. Um, number two, definitely like how do you become more efficient, right? And you know look at reducing all these uh, um, uh, friction points. And, and so, um, but but a, another important factor that's really driving this as well is that, and, and we see this a lot from, um, you, you know, some of my financial industry and financial management colleagues at Deloitte, that many of these policies are being passed down at, that are becoming, they must, they, the best way to follow policy is leverage procurement tools that force adherence to complex buying and approval areas. And in some industries, especially where they're regulated, those are key to protect and reduce risk. And so beyond kind of the revenue generating areas and the optimizations, there's also the, the ability to um, manage regulations um, so that you're following processes and you have clear accountability. Well, and, and you hit on an interesting point there, right? So you think about, um, you talked about regulations and, and having your own procurement. And the one thing I, I like to approach some of the suppliers that I talk to is that, you know, think about it in their own business, right? How are you procuring products? How are you replenishing your inventory? You're doing it through some sort of procurement solution as well. And what do you require of your suppliers or manufacturers that you work with? Now think about how your customers want to do business with you, right? So it's it's looking at that from both sides and realizing that, you know, how you want to be treated as a procurement buyer is how your customers want to be treated as well. Yep. Um, so, yeah, all right, so just to kind of stay on the metric side of things, right? So I'm looking at 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 some of these, um, I guess in, in, I, I've heard a lot of people say that e-commerce is just shift, right? and And I've debated that for a long time. And you still have the naysayers that say, well, all I'm doing is taking an order from, you know, a phone, fax, email, whatever, and I'm moving it to a different channel. But what I've seen throughout my career is that there's growth when you move, right? There's growth when you make it easier. There's growth when you expose all the, 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 the processes to your customer and allow them to you know, take care of it themselves and self-serve. So what's your take on that? I mean, is e-commerce just shift? Is e-procurement integration just shift? Or is there growth potential? Yeah. So in some ways, yes, there's a large portion that is going to be shift, but in some ways it misses the point of the analysis, right? Like you can, you know, if you only looked at maintaining that way of doing business, you're also not looking at that loyalty. Who are the people that you're losing as you go through? And so there's an opportunity cost of not keeping up. And so that's an important factor to think about that if you don't keep up and into that channel, your, your uh, retention is going to decrease. And so it's easy just to make that simple. Well, you're just shifting over. And that's the problem sometimes when you have sales leadership that are focused on, you know, the next quarter, right. As opposed to, 
you know, much a much longer or multiple quarters or looking out a year or two, because that's really the, you know, the, the long term effect of that, that that piece is missed. But um, one important thing to look about it, too, is many times when you talk about, uh, you know, commerce and how to digitize so many times talk about it all as kind of in one channel or black or white. Really, what we work with our industry experts is look at the segmentation strategy. So, for example, there's going to be different segments where this makes much big a much bigger impact. So, for example, you know, you might get like, well, I have a few customers that have been massive. They've been around forever. They use EDI. They're never going to go off, right? You're not going to do anything there. You, you might have another set uh, of customers that you're trying to tag that are maybe medium size to bigger that actually they they might have never started on TEDI and they're using like procurement commerce. So that segment is an important growth area. And in fact, they're being told to drive that. And so how do you connect? So to your question, I would go back to really understand your segmentation strategy. And then how do you think about that business strategy of how to connect? And it's like, if you go back to that omni-channel slide that I had, what we do is think about that, the equivalent of the marketing mix, which piece of tool, you know, between your own commerce, the marketplace, procurement commerce, dealer portal, et cetera, what mix of all those tools will help you drive each of the segments? Okay. So... I love that, right? And I love the fact that now we're thinking about this whole strategy. I guess the last piece that I would 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 wonder, and I think I think some of our audience and some people that I've talked to, quite frankly, have struggled with is where does this sit in my organization? Like who's really responsible for driving it and 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 how do I get more people involved? So kind of a little bit kind of as I mentioned, I, I would see in the commercialization, this is where we're having many of these conversations. So whoever owns the commercialization strategy, and many times that's part of the sales org, that's where it should sit because this should make sure that the salespeople are part of the process, right? What you want to do is make the salesperson as efficient as possible, right? Your best salespeople know your customers. They know what they want to sell. But if they can get off all the admin stuff that they don't have to worry about that a digital tool can do, and they can spend time building relationships and, and setting up a, a sale, that's what's important. That's what you want to do. And, and, and so like, it has to be kind of driven by commercialization and your sales to be truly... Uh, effective this is not like in many ways what, what what we see a lot of when we go to start to have these conversations is somebody in the it group says oh yeah we want to implement this other tech solution well you, you know just like many things like if you just focus on the tech you're not going to get buy-in and really get people along it really has to be driven by that commercialization and sales group yeah that's a great point and and to that right you could you could build it and IT could build it out, but if nobody else is on board with it, it's never going to be successful or rolled out. And and um, the the other question I guess I would have there is, you know, I've seen some sales teams in organizations kind of have a fear of of rolling this out because it's hey, what is my value? And the way I've kind of approached it, and I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. The way I've approached it is like. Hey, your value as as a sales professional is not to take orders; it's to make orders, right? And it's to go sell and be an expert on the products that we specialize in. And you could spend more time selling and growing while somebody else is doing all the the busy work of taking the orders and and doing it behind the scenes, you know, through an automated process. So, is that kind of the similar for you, or do you have any other thoughts around that? Yeah, exactly. Like. You know, if you talk to some of these salespeople, and this is part of when we roll these programs out, like our first first listening is like, who's the, who's the field sales? How are their conversations going? What is their normal day to day? And so much still is being done just administrative. Like, hey, man, I haven't got my order. Where is it? 
uh, hey, can I get this invoice printed? Hey, can you follow up on this request? Like all of these are very uh, manual asks that are a huge pain in the butt. And it's it's not only a pain in the butt for the salesperson, for for the customer. So that that is a lot of the, you know, kind of the, the, the concrete pain points that we're seeing that we really try and drive that really drives kind of the digitization of all those pieces. All right. Excellent. Well, I think that's a, a good point to end on because I feel like that kind of underscores the whole importance, right? Get the sales team involved to really drive success in this channel. And so uh, Melissa, what I could say is, uh, we're going to turn it over to you to open it up for uh, Q and A. Great. Um, the first question that came in, it's, are you seeing any major improvements or enhancements to supplier punch out sites? Any new features that are becoming expected slash standard functionality needed to compete? Um, I can, I can take that first and then, and then Paul, I can guess you could take it from a commerce perspective, but I would say that, um, from a from a punch out side of things, you have to look at what is what is what does a B two B customer really need, and you know you have to measure yourself up against the best and the ones that have been long standing and they offer things like you know um, shopping list type features. They offer the ability to see inventory. I I can't believe how many sites still out there today. You cannot look and see inventory across all fulfillment centers. So it's like being able to dive in and search by your zip code or whoever's fulfilling your products. It's it's being able to connect that piece. It's being able to go through some sort of, of finder capability, right? And so I've seen this, uh, one, of, one of our customers has this great parts finder that if I have a particular product, I can enter that product and it's already showing me all the products that are applicable to that particular item, all the replacement parts. and it just makes it that much easier for that B2B buyer, right? Because you're not trying to really do as much upsell, cross-sell. You're trying to get them as much information so they can get in, find what they need, and get out and do their job. But Paul, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I think I think I would just say um, that the being able to connect more and many of these e-commerce platforms are now much more punch-out friendly. So even before the early punch outs, you didn't have the full rich experience. So instead of having just very basic, bland uh, experiences that don't have punch outs, that just look the standard catalog, it's as if you're at a full e-commerce site and you get that full experience. That's really what's making a difference. And so um, I think that's the huge opportunity is to continue to build that out. Thank you. Um, for the next question, it's for B2C, where e-commerce has exploded, this has become a requirement. But for B2B, especially for manufacturers, how do you justify to management the appropriate resource for these launches and ongoing builds and maintenance when resources are tight? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here on this one because this is, this is what I spend all my time on. And this is why I'm doing this here is in many ways, like the management are using the old play, the old plays out there, which is, oh, you know, selling and some of these tools. Yes, we got to do this financial control. It's just back office stuff. And really, there's just not a, a good understanding. And sometimes it's semantics or ter terminology. And so this is why it's super important that we're, we're trying to get the word out. This B2B commerce omni channel drives net revenue. And I'll give another concrete case that this is something that management can also learn. There was a, um, one of our clients we helped with and we helped one of their divisions go, you know, roll out B2B commerce and build it out. And then they actually got carved out and sold. And it turned out this company ended up getting a 30, 5% bump up in valuation, which translated to a few hundred million because they were digitally enabled and had these tools out there. And so not only is it incremental sales that are happening, but the valuation of the company. And the last that I'll leave with you on here is that 
more of these manufacturing and industrial companies are being called out on earnings call. How digital is your organization? How much are you driving? And so this is going to continue to put the pressure and put the incentives to drive these new tools through. Thank you both. Um, for the next question, it's why is procurement commerce the least known channel? You want to jump in with that one first? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I mean, I, I'll start off with, um, I think a lot of people just, you know, fear of the unknown, right? And that um, in, in when you cannot control it, and sometimes you can't control what that buyer is doing, right? You don't understand that they've chosen this procurement platform and why do they want to stay there and not just go to my my standalone commerce platform, right? And that fear of the unknown, you've kind of segmented, you've built a, a wall between the two. And until you kind of finally realize, as Paul just mentioned, right, that sometimes your commerce platform can have all the great bells and whistles and it be extended to that e-procurement platform in the same way that they walk up to your commerce experience, then you're going to start realizing, you know, the benefits. But until then, you know, you're still going to have a lot of old school mentality of, I'm just happy taking an order this way. I'm happy with them going down my experience. And I just don't kind of want to know it, right? I mean, to me, that's kind of been my experience. And Paul, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, this is, again, these are all new tools, new terms, new management. And so you just got to, it, it's a, it's the learning curve and, and it's it's happening fast. Like you talked about the growth there, 18% last year when overall B2B sales grew two to 3%. So almost five to six times the growth of your overall sales. So it's happening quick. All right, next one. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, for the next question, it's, can I succeed by just having my e-commerce site configured for punch out? I have a team that handles POs and invoices. Is it really that important to automate those transactions? <laughs> well, I'd say the, the simple answer to that is, um, can you succeed? I guess you can from uh, uh, connecting to your customer perspective. Is it going to make it worth your efforts? Um, it's probably the, the the volume that you would have to start to look at, right? I think, Paul, you addressed this earlier too, right? You have to look at your entire organization and the value that you're going to achieve by by connecting not only a an e-commerce experience, but then doing the, the connected commerce side of it. And if you're not thinking about the efficiencies that you're gonna gain and the potential pain or friction you're gonna cause on a customer by doing things manually and just throwing bodies at it, then you're not looking at the true value of the solution. I think you, I think you got it there. Excellent. Um, for the next question, it's I sell niche products and have never been told by my customer I need any of these solutions. Why should I consider selling in this channel? Heck, that could be a, a, a loaded question too. I think, again, Paul kind of addressed a little bit of this earlier with the fact that, you know, for some this may not be the way that their customers buy and and that may be fine. But for others, it's really worth it to do an investigation. And I think the slide that kicked us off of understanding all the different personas is really what you have to figure out first. So you know, maybe you never been told by your customer. And, and quite frankly, I actually, actually was just on a call yesterday with a sales team and someone said, Hey, you know, and I won't name this, this big MRO supplier, they, they're in my customer and they sell to my customer, but my customer never told me that they buy on e-procurement. And my question was, well, if this big MRO supplier is doing punch out, then they're in there before you and, and you probably need to do punch out, even though they've never told you, maybe they didn't realize you had it or were willing to offer those capabilities. So I think part of it is understanding your customer, understanding how they're buying from other suppliers understanding all personas right in that organization because if you're just going to walk through and and ignore it all 
then eventually I'll, I'll, I'll defer to a good friend of mine who runs e-procurement at a, at a scientific firm where she says, if you don't know and you're not hearing it from them, you're probably no longer their first call. You're probably their fourth or fifth. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I think we have time for one more. Um, and it's how do you quantify the ROI of punch out or related integration? Sure, this, this is something we do a lot of. Um, and, and this one, again, it, there's no one simple way, right? But you have to look at kind of inherent what your industry, because there's probably different factors. So normally what we do with these is look at segments, industry, um, your place in the marketplace and, you know, potential loyalty growth and back and forth. So we, we've worked a lot of different ROI models by industry and, and, and to tune that. Um, but again, these our growth and we see different buckets. So there's no one model. So that's the first thing. So the second thing is there's um, efficiency buckets that there's factors that, you know, less cost around the distribution and the, you know, the replacement of some manual work that people can be redeployed. There's one. There's also a loyalty factor of, you know, increased growth. And there's also the, um, retention increase. So there's a few buckets that help to articulate what that ROI means. And, and again, if there's any more detailed questions, happy to, you know, to, you know, if somebody wants to follow up with me. And, and I would just add one more to that, Paul, is that we also have kind of that build versus buy piece. And so, you know, on, on the trade centric side, we do have an ROI tool that kind of measures that that IT resource allocation, right? So how much would you save by not having to build it all in that capabilities and the connections and the ongoing maintenance versus having to do it yourself? Yep. Excellent, thank you both. Um, and thank you everybody for joining, submitting questions and answering our poll questions. Um, and with that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again for joining. Bye everyone.